Well, I, it was a, a full African-American experience in education. Uh, I was privileged to go there for, I wasn't a, an actual student there, I was enrolled for special classes there. But it was a full experience from the band to the football team to the music department and really produced some pretty incredible people from, from each of those. Joe Carroll Moffat, who I was there, was outstanding uh, vocalist. Louis Nelson, who went on to lead the, the band drum major at uh, uh, Grambling State University, was there during that time when I was in school. Phenomenal football players like um, uh, Hollywood Henderson. So it was, it, it, it just embodied everything that an all African American or black school should. It was a fun atmosphere. We partied together. I was a Johnson student attending some classes there, but it, it really kept me centered in that, that uh, my African American is. Well, there's a couple of them. One, I was on the basketball team at Johnston. So one of, the, one of the fun things to do for me was during basketball season, going over there class during the day after the big pep rallies and stuff and even for the football team and having to deal with walking through that gauntlet of students who all knew who I was, knew why I was there, but knew I was from the rival school. Because during that time, because of the split between some of us from the from the East Austin neighborhoods who went to John Allen Johnson to Keelan Anderson, you know, it was just it was a fun rivalry thing. We all went out together, we partied together on the weekend, but when it was football and basketball season. So I remember one year going and uh, the principal, Mr. Gaines, having to uh, escort us through the back doors of the school to get into the basketball game and escort us back in. That's how tough the rivalry was. I mean, it was, it was, it was tough, but it was fun. It was a fun rivalry. It was no, you know, huge fights or anything like we just, we just, but that, that was one of the most memorable moments was going through it. And then my very first day going there, walking through that same gauntlet, because then on Thompson's side of the street, everybody would sit out in the front of that was then the front of the school. Now the alternative learning center is there. That's the back of the school. But all the students would sit out there. And my very first day going there, my parents had to drop me off. And I had to walk through that gauntlet. And everybody said, yeah, there he is a Johnston Ram. Uh, like I was a, a turncoat or something, but it, that was, I, I'll never forget that moment and me just kind of holding my head up and saying, it doesn't matter what school I'm at, I'm still Billy Harden, the, the black man, I thought it was then anyway. And uh, walking through that, that was fun. And, and I never forgot that moment. Because, to be real honest with you, because we were coming from Johnston and there were students from other schools, Austin High had a couple of students there, Crockett had a couple of students there, and I want to say a few students from Reagan. The other schools opt out. How I got there was they were, they had uh, started AISD's first uh, technology computer class, and I was selected uh, out of what I, we started with 20, but only 12 students accepted it because the 20 students were to go to Austin High School campus when it was on Rio Grande. We were going, that's where we thought we were going over the summer. We got selected in our sophomore year and we were going to go for half a day to Austin High for our junior year. It was a great experience, but because some things changed in the busing uh, over the summer, they decided to get and encourage uh, more white students to come to uh, Anderson, they were they changed and moved it to Anderson. Well, and it backfired because some of the white kids just pulled out of the program. I think we had two that showed up, I think, from Reagan High School, but no other of the Anglo kids decided to come. So we, uh, we ended up, that's how I actually ended up going to Anderson, but it was... Uh, um, it was it was it was a memorable experience, and uh, we were kind of sheltered in that first semester. Now, second semester it opened up, so when you ask the teacher relationship, I had a very good relationship with my technology teacher, who was uh, Miss Finstermaker, who was actually married to my assistant principal back at Johnston. So she had a connection with us and from the with the Johnston students. But what I remember, was my parents went to Anderson and some of the teachers who were still there, because my parents were pretty young, were still teaching there. And a lot of my friends had mothers and fathers who were teachers there as well. Uh, it, was, it was a very mom-pop, mom-student 
and dad to student relationship with not just with the Andersons, but even with me because I knew Mr. Britton and Miss uh, Miss Britton and many of the teachers who were there taught my parents, so they knew me. So back then, they 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 would chastise you just like they were your mom and daddy. Well, during the civil rights movement, you know, it was the church and the school. It, that, those were the focal points. Those were the meeting places. Those were the places we could come together. And you had people like Dorothy Turner emerging then in the community and fighting for things for Anderson High School. So it was, it was the place where it all came together. I remember they had the Booster Club and they had talent shows and they had these after school, these evening dinners and pancake suppers. It, it, it was, it was, a, it was the, not just the school, it was the community center as well. It was where we came together in the community to enjoy each other and to fight some of those uh, political battles. <laughs> Being a teacher and an administrator, um, I, I think then there was a, obviously a lot less uh, toleration for the nonsense. It, it, was, it was pretty much, a, I'm the teacher and that's how it goes. And, and it, it worked then. I don't know if it necessarily would work today for kids today just because of the way we've been reculturalized, I'll say, than we were then. It was more of educating the community and the community was involved in the education of, of all students then. Um, it, it was more, uh, there were smaller classes, obviously. I don't ever remember being in a class in high school at Johnson or Anderson with more than 15 or 20 people. And nowadays you've got these high school classes, 30, 40 kids in them. And, and so I think it was, it was more personal, uh, closer relationship, but, but it was, it was more from a lectural. It was the teacher had the knowledge base and you were there to take advantage of that knowledge base. Whereas today's education is more of a sharing, but I think it's because the variety, the diversity of the students populations today is so different. Uh, when you're, when you're trying to educate this wide of a diverse population, you, you have to look at other ways of garnishing information and sharing information and allowing students to grow in their learning. And so it's not a bad thing, but I, I think it, and, I, and it's too early to tell which is the most effective, uh, you know, discipline wise, I think we could go back to some of those old ways of, of the building within students more respect and empathy for others. I think that part has been lost, that ability to, uh, to be able to, to, for the teacher to take that time to build some of those character things. We're losing a lot of that. And, uh, but the stakes are so high now for education with testing. It wasn't, I remember we took the IT BS test back then. You took it, you did well, you didn't. You, if you did really well, you were in group one. If you did okay, you were in group two. If you didn't do so well, you were in group three. And teachers made those adjustments to help students that way. And now with integrated learning, it usually doesn't happen that way. Everybody has to do differentiated instruction and, and get everybody involved together. That, that I think is a good thing, can be a good thing. But um, whether or not in education we manage that well, or whether or not we prepare teachers for it well enough to do it, is really is going to be to me that that's going to be the the telltale. That that's how we will know: are teachers being trained and prepared for these diverse populations of learning? Back then they were. They knew they were coming in. They had to be in control of the content. They had to know that content because if students were challenging what was going on or didn't know, that teacher had to know, but the teachers knew that content very, very well. I remember during Texas State Teachers Week, our teachers came to our house for dinner. I mean, that was one of the commitments they would make. They'd come to your house. And so you knew that and you knew your parents were connected to that teacher and you knew that if that teacher had an expectation and you didn't meet that expectation or weren't doing what you were doing and supposed to be doing in class, that your parents were supporting that teacher. It wasn't gonna be the teacher, the parent running up screaming and yelling at the teacher, how you treat my child. You knew that if that teacher went home, but the teachers were more in tune to what what uh, they wanted from students and what they, they knew then what students were going to need 
to survive in, in a world that back then and even so now even, but more so then, was very hostile toward African Americans, particularly African American males. And so they were more in tune to know what disciplines those students were going to need to go into the real world. We didn't know that as students then what they were doing, but later I reflected back and thought they were they were teaching me that and, and teaching me to be organized and having punitive me measures for when I wasn't, if my homework wasn't in on time, because it was teaching me to meet deadlines and that there are consequences for not doing so in the job world. And we, we're losing that now because we're appeasing so much because it's just easier to deal with these kids and not their parents because many times parents will come into the situation uh, in an adverse way or an aggressive way even in some cases and can be very intimidating and a lot of teachers just, I don't want to deal with that. Parents, so if he wants to put his head down and sleep in the corner, then he can put his head down and sleep in the corner. And that's the onus of that is on us as parents and as adults and in education. We've got to come together and, and not allow that to happen. And I think losing institutions uh, like Elsie Anderson um, may, may be costing us some, some things like that. I think we can put them back in. Certainly the talent is there in the teacher pool, but whether or not uh, they're being encouraged to do so, that's the big question. Are we encouraging teachers to have that kind of um, authority and control in those classrooms? And of course, the other side of the coin is there have been teachers in modern era who have abused it. So we've got we've to sit at that table together and get this thing right. Our kids deserve it. I felt like um, that when the school did close, it, it really did shut off a huge chunk of not just the, the education piece, but the cultural piece of the community went with the, with the closing of the school. Um, schools can be a very good community rallying point, and high schools particularly can, because it's that pinnacle, it's that bridge between uh, the work world and higher education, and that comfort zone that students have to have from making that transition to the work world to and to higher education comes from the atmosphere that's set in that high school. What happened when this school, when Anderson closed, was for the East Austin community that was very displaced. And students' allegiances, like as we were saying earlier, were displaced and they were going to get an education but that that whole rallying around because as much as we want to say school is important for education football teams and basketball teams and track teams and those extracurricular activities and the band those are important to, to students because we're not with them when they're in the community bragging about their band or their football team or their basketball team with their friends when you take that away and you bust them to other communities that they're not connected with, they're in the educational setting, but then they have to come back home. And for them, they don't make that distant connection to those things, those extracurricular activity things. And all the studies that I've ever read, those extracurricular activities and being involved with them is one of the hugest indicators of student academic success. Students who are involved in, academic, in extracurricular activities tend to do better academically than students who are not. And so I think you lost that. I, I don't have the stats in front of me, but I have a feeling that the number of students who came out of this community who were involved in band, for instance, had to have diminished greatly. The number of students who were involved in choir, and we're talking about African-American students, uh, who were involved in, in uh, uh, drama, diminished tremendously when they had to go because you've got rehearsals, you got to get to these things and you got to get back home and then performances, you got to get your parents there and many times transportation was an issue. So it was a bigger picture than that. Certainly the, the young men and women who played sports got a chance to see, you know, they had late football buses because that helped to en enhance their team. So they made the effort to get us in sports. They always make that effort. They'll do what they can do. But there were, there were other, the arts, I think, were, were lost. And, uh, and so even developing African-American theater and that, I think, suffered when the school 